for some announcements to make. I'm afraid David can't be here tonight. I feel him out Christmas shopping, I think. A uh, few announcements to make tonight. First, the, the first next thing coming up actually is an imaging group uh, meeting, an imaging group Zoom on the 28th. And uh, Bob Coates will be discussing his trip to Tenerife and the results of his astro imaging attempts out there. So that's on the 28th, uh, half past seven. So there'll be a Zoom link sent out for that. <coughs> First thing up in the new year is going to be the uh, EPO Members Night, which is on the 9th of January, 7 o'clock to 9pm. And that's followed on the Thursday by a beginners uh, group at Acre Road Observatory who will be discussing the sun. And that's a uh, half seven start, so up there for half seven now by nine o'clock. Uh, then there's an online lecture, the actual time I have this year is going to be the online lecture by Steve Edberg, ex-JPL, and he'll be doing it live on Zoom, and he'll be discussing mission development at NASA, and that's 7.30 to 9pm on the Friday the 12th of January, it was a bit of a departure from a Thursday night lecture, but that still allows to have the beginner's session at Acre Road on the 11th. And then we've got the Observer Session, that comes quite late in the month, uh, in the middle of the month, it's going to be on the 14th. Again, that will be a Zoom and that will be hosted by Robert. And uh, it will be um, 7.30 till 9 or thereabouts again. The, and then we've got final, an ECMO Public Night uh, on Monday the 15th of January. So the first couple of weeks are quite busy half seven till nine o'clock. Now ASU members can come along to it as long as they're willing to contribute to the event, basically man a telescope or help out. And uh, the other thing that we've got uh, tonight, um, we've got a bit of an urgency here for those who want to go to Glen Carthar. Anybody want to go to Glen Carthar the dark skies weekend? Well, if you do, you've got to have your money in as soon as possible, because we've got to do it. Um, we'll see if we can get a, a, an email reminder out to you, if not tonight, tomorrow night, and uh, get back to us as soon as possible, the numbers that are going. So far we get 17 people, and uh, there might be a couple of dropouts, but there should be enough room. Uh, but we'll need to get this booked in fairly quickly. Uh, the Blancapa weekend is the 23rd, Friday the 23rd to Sunday the 25th of February. And that's followed by quite a busy week for the uh, street after that. So that's the 23rd to 25th of February. If you want to go, you need to make your mind up now. You need to get your money in. Okay. I'm sorry we don't have any calendars here tonight, but if somebody wants a calendar, you can probably send us an email. The great new gifts. I find that I've got to get a bunch of them every year because you get the same stuff every year. You get Scotty Dog calendars, but the SD calendars are quite appreciated and people are sending them to this year. So we've still got a few left if you want them. And uh, we've set a date for the Royal Society of Protection of Builds down at Loch Winnock. Uh, <coughs> I think we've settled on the 15th of March, but that's a while off. We don't need to worry about that too much. Now, on with tonight's lecture, we have Mr. Robert Law, who's a long-standing member of the ESG, and several others, who has had an interest in space flight since the age of eight. We were just discussing Apollo 8 when we came in there. It was 55 years ago tonight. They're heading out to the moon. Uh, Robert's been uh, interested in space flight since he was a boy, and the first space flight he watched live was Apollo 10 in May 1969 following every space mission since then and meeting lots of astronauts and cosmonauts at astronaut events. Robert joined Paisley Astronomical Society in 1971 and attended his first ASG meeting in 1973. He joined the Society in 1976 and he served on the council for many years and was the observing section at Acre Road Observatory liaison. He was at one point a vice president 
He was the honorary curator at Airdrie Observatory from 1982 to 1987 and from 1999 to 2002. In 1989 he was offered a position at Coates Observatory, Paisley becoming responsible for public viewing sessions with the 10 inch telescope showing groups around and giving planetarium talks. In 2002 he became a visitor assistant at Mills Observatory in Dundee where he is still based today. He is an honorary member of the Ayrshire Astronomical Society and the Airdrie Astronomical Association. And he had also attended two shuttle launches, STS-59 and STF-89. And is also a regular visitor to Cape Kennedy and has a wealth of knowledge on the American space program. So, would you please put your hands together and welcome Mr. Robert Law talking tonight about Skylab. So, I'm going to look back a long time ago, we're going to go back 50 years because uh, we, we've spent the, the, we've all been commemorating spending the last so many years, the 50th uh, anniversary of Apollo. Uh, and tonight I'm going to be talking about the Apollo Space Station. Uh, so that, that was uh, launched way back in a, uh, 1973, and that's the, the program a badge. Uh, Skylab was something that evolved out of the Apollo Applications Program. We'll talk about that in a minute too. Now, the way that we thought, you know, what is, this is what people thought a space station would look like. All the uh, pioneers of the astronautics, like Hermann Oberth, uh, my late friend Oscar Schwiegelhofer, who was the curator at Airdrie with me in the 1980s, was, he was a student of, of Hermann Oberth. Uh, Robert Goddard in the United States, Arthur C. Clarke in England and Werner von Braun in Germany. All these people said that what we would do is that we would build a space station in Earth's orbit and that space station would be a staging post to go to the moon and the planets because the most of your, the most difficult part of going into space and the most expensive part is getting off the Earth because of the Earth's gravitational well. Uh, and once you get to a space station, and providing it's in the proper orbit, which is something that the International Space Station is certainly not, it is then easy to get places. In the 1940s, uh, Von Braun, late 40s, early 50s, went round all the generals and the Air Force people telling them that their new shiny B-52 bombers were totally obsolete, which they were. Uh, but most to the annoyance of all the generals and all the rest of it, they didn't like this one bit either. And he offered uh, in the late 40s to build in orbit a space station and come up with a whole architecture of how you would do that and he basically said, who controls orbital space controls the planet. Uh, and that statement, and people fell around laughing at that statement, <coughs> etc. that politicians and certain other people is still true 50, 60, 70 years later. Uh, and he offered me a space station that would have a crew of about 40 people in it. It would provide satellite television, and um, we're talking about here in the 1940s when we're still on 405 lines from Alexandra Palace, uh, and television didn't even exist in Scotland at that point. Uh, weather forecasting, uh, earth resources, and astronomy, and all these, uh, uh, and of course the most important reason why most countries, military reasons, uh, defense national security. <laughs> And all you had to do was put four tips, nuclear missiles on the space station and you could orbit around the planet and control everything you wanted. <coughs> and of course, as we all know, what happened on October 4th, 1957, the Soviet Union launched the Sputnik. 
And of course, this then created a panic in the United States. Because if you can get into orbit, you know, you can put a nuclear bomb anywhere on the Earth that you want, you know. Uh, the outcome of this was that this really was too expensive. And the idea, of course, it looks like a wheel, was it would spin round and it would create an artificial gravity. Why would you need 47 people? Because most of the time would be in maintenance, uh, replacing uh, valves, thalonic valves. And if we, what my American friends call tubes. And if we go back to the 60s, when we were watching Apollo on the TV, the tricky point is that they, if the, you put the TV on and there'd be no picture and the sound would find all the sound would be, you know, and my dad would have to phone up the guy to come out and it was to take the back off the telly and a valve had gone. And valves had to be replaced, unlike the electronics we have today that are a lot more reliable. And various versions of this, and you actually looked into an, it being an inflatable thing, it would be blown up. So the idea of inflatable half modules in the space program is not new, because we've been talking about them since the 1940s. But this, this kind of idea, the ultimate of this idea was in the movie 2001 A Space Odyssey. Uh, and what you see in that film isn't high floating sci-fi, because that was based on studies done within NASA and within industry. The problem with what you saw in 2001, it was just too expensive, and that's the only reason why it never happened. Uh, uh, so it's back to the drawing board, uh, as things are progressing in the early 60s. The Apollo program is up and running. NASA, when Eisenhower set up his space agency, NASA wanted to aim to put up a space station. But they were sidetracked by Kennedy's commitment to go to the moon. So all that went out the window, and we're in a space race, and we're going to the moon. By the time we get to about 1965, 66, Werner von Braun is very worried about what is going to happen to all the space workers. These space workers are the most important people that you have. Without space workers, you don't have a space program. And if you sack all your space workers, as what a certain president did about 10 years ago, then well, that leads to huge problems and you fall far behind and, and it's a nightmare. And so Von Braun came up with this applications program because when Kennedy said we're going to put a man on the moon and bring it, he didn't say that we're going to do it more than once. He didn't say we're going to do two, three, four, five or six times, you know. And they looked into what could they do. And they came up with various missions that using our, our, our Apollo type equipment. And then the, the, the serious problems in the Apollo program, President Johnson has to get uh, General Phillips to go in and ask her to sort out the mess. And then of course, what happens of course on the 27th of January 1967, and one of my, my interests in space is it's not like uh, when my team loses, it's not like, no, no, you can get next week, people die. Uh, and, and three astronauts get killed. Uh, and there's a big investigation and that delays things, you know. Uh, but that then causes Congress to slash NASA's budget and all the rest of it. So what that then means is that the Apollo Applications Project basically goes out the window. Uh, and the only thing that is left is the possibility of a space station. And this is on the back of a beer mark kind of thing by Werner von Braun, proposal to put a cylinder inside the Saturn 1B rocket, launch that into space, and then that cylinder becomes, a, it's in orbit, and it becomes a simple space station. Very primitive way of doing it. So by 1967, we get to something like this. Uh, and the, by this point in 1967, we have two proposals, a wet space station and a dry space station. Uh, and we're using components of the Apollo spaceship and Saturn V or the Saturn 1B. A wet space station basically would involve the launch of one rocket, the Saturn 1B rocket, 
the second stage goes into orbit, the fuel is vented, uh, the astronauts then turn round when they dock onto this thing and they go through the door inside and they start fitting it out. It takes about four flights to put up equipment. Uh, the thing is that in the astronaut office nobody's very happy about this proposal at all, you know. So there is another proposal that they did look at and that was converting the second stage of the moon rocket to build a 12-man space station. Uh, and so you would basically have a first stage, second stage and a dummy second stage of a massive rocket. But that was too expensive, so they, they then changed that idea to using the, the S4B stage or the third stage in the Saturn V rocket. Uh, punting that up, and this is an early design of a wet space station. Uh, you can see there's a lunar module attached at the top there. They put uh, solar panels on it, uh, and it, it's got a telescope because one of the early things uh, in the applications program was space telescopes, and particularly solar telescopes was one of the things that they wanted to do. Uh, here's another, like a cut away from, so you get this huge, yeah, this is massive compared to, the, the volume in this thing is massive <coughs> compared to what you have in the today's space stations. Now, at this time, the US Air Force uh, was working on its own space station. And in the Soviet Union, they were working on space stations as well. And of course, the Russians in 1971 had the world's first space station. And I remember reading the headline. The first I found out about it was the Daily, Scottish Daily Express, a house in space. Uh, this is absolutely amazing. The, the Russians had given up with the moon because they just simply <coughs> couldn't do it, you know. And so they decided to concentrate on space stations. And even at 11 years old, I realised that this in many ways is a lot more important than the Americans going to the moon. Uh, and, and that is big, they've done a staging post. And of course it all ends in tragedy, you know, because I read the teacher telling me that the cosmonauts have died. Running home from school with tears, the news on. And at that time, our you know, our knowledge 50 years ago on medical science and how the human body reacts in space was pretty primitive, you know. Uh, and many people were saying, uh, the, you know, well maybe they were saying that the, the, the mankind, the, the human body can't sustain long periods in space. I mean, nobody would feel been, they sent Jim Lovell up and Frank Borman up in the Gemini capture for 14 days, which was the estimated time uh, to get to the moon and back, uh, could the human body, could you survive that amount of time? I thought, well, maybe the cosmos died because of the heart failure with the return to gravity. It wasn't years later that we discovered the real reason, and it was to do with faulty valve, and they weren't they were wearing spacesuits, so they died. If they had spacesuits on, they'd be all right. In the 60s, the main reason uh, for space station was military reasons, uh, a defense, intelligence, surveillance, basically. And the US Air Force came up with this option to use the Gemini capsule with a, a space station launching on a, a, ta a Titan 3C rocket. So it's a similar kind of rocket that launched the Voyagers to the planets and Viking to Mars. It's quite unique because you enter through into the space station through a hole in the hatch, you know, on the heat shield, which is a kind of controversial to look. So I've actually seen this space, so the, the launched one. It is a myth that the Columbia was the first reusable uh, human rated spaceship. It wasn't, it was a Gemini. Uh, and you can go and see the capsule at Cape Canaveral at the, the, the Air Force Space Museum and it has a, a, a hatch on the back of it. So you get a lot of the, the kids' toy rockets and all that, the capsule goes on backwards, you know, instead of front to this. It's not as daft as what it looks because you can actually do it by going through the hatch. Uh, 
one of the problems about this was that technology in the 60s was starting to accelerate. And then people realised, well, you don't need to send men into space to do spying because you can send up satellites and that. So the, if there was a while that the Air Force and NASA worked side on side uh, uh, with this uh, when they were both working in two separate uh, a, a programs. Uh, and so Skylab actually has uh, a Gemini hatch on it from a Gemini capsule. That's what they use for the, the, the EVA hatch when you were doing a spacewalk. So you can see there's the, the door there. Uh, what then happened was in 1969, <coughs> Uh, the manned orbiting laboratory was cancelled. The Air Force at one point also had their own space shuttle, the dinosaur, uh, and that was cancelled. And a lot of these astronauts that were training in that program, and they, they had blue space suits rather than the normal light the NASA people had, they were eventually transferred into the space shuttle. And the most famous of these astronauts, of course, was Robert Crippen who flew on the first flight of the shuttle. <coughs> the second option was uh, a dry space station. A dry space station meant that on the ground you converted uh, the fuel tank, the third stage, you built in all your facilities, uh, then this would be launched, but this would require a Saturn V moon rocket. The, the, uh, instead of a Saturn, it would be a lot more expensive and you can launch a space station in one go. None of the nonsense of the International Space Station at $250 billion and 29 uh, different launches has taken almost it, the best part of 20 years to complete. You can put up a space station in one go for a tiny fraction of the cost, more volume in it, etc. Uh, it would have a solar panels to power systems that would have a space telescope, uh, so you know the windmill feature at the top there, uh, and you would have all this stuff in here uh, inside. And so this diagram here shows how it, it was fitted, how you know, all the different equipment and areas. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have a laser pointer, but the. You, the, the, the bottom of the fuel tank there, you can see that kind of red, gold type kind of vase thing. That, that, you open that light and that was when you get rid of your rubbish, you chuck your rubbish in that hole basically. Uh, one of the things that was left over from development of the wet, wet, wet space station, you, you see that the floors aren't solid, they look like a grid pattern. And that, that was uh, to allow the rocket uh, fuel to go through the floors here. Uh, that, that survived on to the, 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 the dry. Now, space stations and submarines are directly related uh, because the Soviet Union took a lot of what the Soviet Navy had learned on operating submarines and life support of submarines and basically like, living in a space station, you live undersea, you need an atmosphere. NASA wanted to try out, or uh, to find out how, what we could do in a space station. So the way they did that is they sent astronauts on a mission in a submarine, on this submarine here that you see in the picture. And it went away for like a month or whatever. And, and it was just to get an idea of uh, how things would operate. Uh, once they did that and the hardware is getting more mature, uh, as what they also, the kind of upfront testing they did for the Apollo spaceship, uh, they, they have a, a, a Skylab mission on the ground uh, where it's pressurised, it's got an atmosphere in it, and the astronauts go inside and they're in there for so many weeks or whatever doing a, a simulating doing a mission on the ground. And that way you're testing that all that this stuff works. And so it's called Smith and the crew of Crippen, Bob Cole and Thornton. And all these people went on to fly in the space shuttle program later on. 
So that's the space station and the beginning of construction of the space station. It had the computer and the uh, the computer they used uh, was the an IBM TC1 System 4 PI, and it was a 16-bit computer, and it had software to run all the, the systems, and you could run it on a 16K mode or a 8-bit 8K mode. And this basically was the same computer that would be later used for the space shuttle. And you can see the, the, the slot in panels with the convexity on that. Uh, and this diagram here shows the computer program for Skylab. So input, read, output, telemetry, switching processor, an intermediate loop, a slow loop, and a weak state. Another thing that you needed for a space station uh, and a lot of spacecraft, you could be we really the, the public's first concern about that would be the Hubble Space Telescope. You need you to get the, your position in that space, you need gyroscopes. And if these gyroscopes fail, that causes serious problems. So Skylab had three gyroscopes. Theoretically it could work with one gyroscope, but we wouldn't want that, we would want at least two. And as far as I can remember, I don't think there was ever any issues with the, the giant scopes. Uh, so the show you some, I think these pictures are from uh, a Space Museum in Houston. I think this is, really, or this is from uh, it's Alabama. So they built, what basically happened was that NASA put in an order to McDonnell Douglas for two space stations to be built. So there's a lot of talk about a third space station. I mean, at one point, there was going to be, it could have been a low Earth orbital space station, there was going to be a geo, geosynchronous space station, and then it was Moonlap. Finally, we're actually getting Moonlap about 50 years later, that one's actually going to happen. Uh, so this is uh, when Gary, oh, it's like sucking a dummy, oh no, it's an actual photo of him, and he's, uh, He's, that's what your, your sleeping accommodation was uh, a lot better than the International Space Station because uh, Clinton cancelled the US half module and it meant like the, uh, the Russians had to their half module, the Americans could only sleep in nodes on the floor and all the rest of it. So uh, this is what you're, you're sleeping in Skylab is like. This is a space toilet on Skylab. Uh, this photograph is not showing the uh, I, uh, the, uh, I think it's the green thing you use, it's like a vacuum cleaner. Uh, I can't remember any problems with the space toilet on the uh, space, space station, uh, though the, the shuttle toilet did have its problems early on. And you have a kitchen, you have it, so it's actually known like in naval terms as a galley. Uh, and the space food that you got in Apollo with the Gemini that was absolutely disgusting. So by the time we get to Skylab, they're starting to learn a bit more like space food. And what space food, so, and, and we are, you can see here that you're beginning to see things here that are, that you're going to see in a space shuttle. So if you look at the, the like the firing cabinet things at the back, this kind of idea was then put into the space shuttle when we built that. One of the things that Skylab had was a newfangled thing they came out with, it was called a microwave oven. Uh, and you get your, your dinners in these little like, tuna tins, you know, uh, that you could then microwave these. Uh, uh, and and, and the, there's a big window in the wall so you can have a look out on your spare time and have a look at the view. Uh, next door to the kitchen, we've got the space shower. So the, you know, the, the, the probably the easiest way to, you know, to, to wash basically is just dump your damp cloth and all that, and you're, you're down there. That's a, an, an energy saving tip <laughs> in this cost of living crisis. So we'll have to do that. That's what you do in space. But Skylab, 
had, I mean, I, I don't actually think the International Space Station actually has got anything like this that's sophisticated as a shower in it. Huge, huge volume of space inside Skylab. Massive compared to what you have in the ISS. Of course, back in the, the 70s, we are still, this film, you know, the analog age, you know, we're still using film. One of the problems with film in space is radiation and all the rest of it. So they, they have to have, a, they develop a special vault where they put the, uh, the film and all that would be stored. <coughs> and use 35 millimeter film. And we also use the Polaroid SX-70 camera. Oh, okay, I'll we'll talk about that in a minute too. The spacesuit was a development from the Apollo spacesuit, uh, and it, you, one of the main difference that when you go back to using a, a, an umbilical cable uh, to bring in your oxygen and all the rest of it, as what's used in Gemini, and we're going to go back to this system with Artemis. You know, uh, the uh, I so you've got an umbilical, uh, and so the Skylab astronauts would have to do spacewalks, EVA, extravehicular activities. But the main job that you had to do was to get outside to the Apollo telescope now, and you had to take out the exposed films, bring them in, and then go out to the telescope and load up new film. It's like putting film in your camera. The only reality is, I'll come to it in a minute, we, they were serious problems to begin with, so they had a lot more space walks than what they expected. They made, uh, they, they made uh, changes to the Apollo spacecraft, uh, a, just the same as what the Russians or the Soviets did with Soyuz. If you ever go to the National Space Center in Leicester, and it's not a real space center, it's just like a glass, it's a space museum now. Uh, it's really good. Uh, they have a, a Soyuz spacecraft in it, and it's a lunar Soyuz. And a lunar Soyuz is different to the crippled version of the Soyuz that the Russians use today, because if you're just going into a low Earth orbit to a space station, you do not need a big heavy heat shield. Uh, your service module area, you need more tanks and it's bigger. When we're only going into, uh, uh, into the, we don't need as much stuff. So there's a lot of changes was done in the service module. And you notice that the command module is white. Uh, and the reason why it's white and there's a lot of white uh, paint on, on the side there and that is the, because it was going to be in space in Apollo, it was only really going to be in space for about eight, nine, ten days. With Skylab, it was going to be in space for months. So the white colour basically reflects the sunlight off it to cool it down. So in the summer time, uh, if I go out and I'm wearing a black watch kilt, I'm going to be sweltered, you know. And if I go out and wear a dress Stuart kilt because it's bright, the light bounces off me. So that, that's basically what we, what we do, uh, you know, to uh, uh, have it in space. And so the Americans, like the Soviets, altered it because Soyuz was originally designed for cosmonauts to go to the moon, not to space stations. So they, they made uh, a design changes to adapt it. So this gives you an idea. Now, the... During the Apollo program, the NASA had three rockets, the Saturn 1, the Saturn 1B, and the Saturn 5. Uh, the Saturn 1 was used in the early 60s for testing stuff, uh, and then the 1B was more powerful. It was actually, the first stage was actually built by Chrysler. Uh, the, uh, the second stage was built by McDonnell Douglas. And it was only capable of putting uh, astronauts into Earth's orbit if you couldn't go to the moon. And when the Apollo program started, they had a whole series of, they wanted to do testing of various uh, flights of practice and learning how to do stuff, uh, like rendezvous and docking, so you don't need to go to the moon to do stuff like that, or testing out the lunar module, you don't need to do that in the Earth orbit. 
Uh, that was that NASA only had uh, so many of these rockets. And because of the issues uh, in the space program, when General Phillips went in, he cut out a lot of these, uh, and he went on an Elon Musk mode, basically, of doing it more up front and adding the risk, you know. Uh, and that's how you see Starship blowing up all the time. Because, uh, so Apollo 8, somebody was saying it tonight, said it was at the 50th anniversary of the launch. Uh, that was very dangerous, you know, they, they went straight, you know. But they, so there were some of these rockets left over, and they lay around for years inside the vehicle assembly building. And the problem is, is they aged and then they became problems. Uh, and when the moon program <coughs> ended, one of the reasons why, as I said, when I, I did the talk last year about Apollo 17, was that NASA cut the moon flights because they wanted to build a space station and they needed to try to save some of these Saturn rockets to launch Skylark. Uh, but these rockets, they, they, I, can't, I think they only had something like four or five of these rockets available. Because uh, uh, Nixon cut the, in 1971, they stopped the production uh, and so the, the diagram on the, 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 the side above me, you can see the size of Skylab compared to Salyut, the first space station, a lot bigger. And then the, the top bit, you can see uh, the, you know, how it's fitted the, uh, with a shroud at the top. Now, people think that the Saturn V rocket could only send astronauts to the moon, which is just absolute nonsense. It could send astronauts to Mars uh, and Venus, the asteroids, uh, and this is the kind of how it would look to launch the components for the manned Mars, the NERFA, the thermal nuclear spaceship, uh, would involve five Saturn V rockets to launch the components. Uh, <coughs> when you get rid of the J2 engine on the third stage and you replace, you replace that with a nuclear engine, uh, and you launch it in its orbit, and then you launch three of these, you join them together, and then you launch the, the spaceship that takes about two watts to do not two flights. So you give you an idea of the size of Skylab compared to the ISS. The ISS looks massive compared to Skylab, but look at the size of the modules are tiny. Uh, that uh, is roughly the same size as the, the present, the most advanced space station we have is time gone. Uh, the Chinese space, they were doing our spacewalk earlier on this morning, seven hours, and it's just slightly, it's slightly, the Chinese one is slightly bigger than that. They had to make uh, modifications for the infrastructure because the, the Saturn 1B was launched from the com launch complex 37, I think it uh, was it 37, and uh, what was the, and it was, uh, was it 43, I can't remember, at Cape Canaveral. When you, if you ever go to the Launch Control Centre, uh, at the, at, at, at which is on Meta Island, it's not actually on at Cape Canaveral, the, the BBC have always got it wrong, you know. The shuttle was never launched from Cape Canaveral, it was launched from Meta Island. It's a bit like Thunderbirds, Tracy Island. <laughs> so the, uh, you get to the firing room, and we've got all the, the badges of all the flights on the wall. Uh, and you look at it, there's one missing. Apollo 7 is not there. Because Apollo 7 was not launched uh, at, Cape, at, at Cape Canaveral. Sorry, at Meta Island was launched at Cape Canaveral. We're waiting for Elon to make his mind up. Uh, he is a uh, commercial uh, Axiom uh, 3 space mission with an all European crew uh, and uh, SpaceX have been converting a launch pad at launch complex 40 uh, <coughs> in, the, in, the, in the Cape side and uh, these astronauts could be the first people since Apollo uh, 7 to be launched at Cape Canaveral but as, as I'm, at the moment I haven't heard yet what Elon's doing about it. Uh, as they get into the world a lot. In Apollo 
Uh, what they had to do was that the Saturn 1B rocket was too small for the mobile launch platform. So they made this stand, basically, that it was known as the milk stool, which, which brought the rocket up to the height of where the white room is for the capsule at the top. And then you've got the, the launch support structure, which is on a, a crawler. That's basically, you know, why they've got the built two crawlers. The NASA, they don't have this, and they don't have money to build one of these things now for SLS. And that's why when we had problems uh, last year with SLS, it had to be rolled back to the vehicle assembly <coughs> building so that they could fix the problems. During Apollo, you didn't have to do this, you could do it out at the pad. And this, these, these, this, so this is the, uh, uh, you know, the, the, how it, 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 on the ground. <coughs> But we had to have a lot of communications and that involved, uh, nowadays it's all done with satellites, but they, so they had the Americans like the, the Russians had ships, satellite dishes at different parts. Uh, and then Skylab was going to do, there's a whole lot of research areas that they were going to be doing. Uh, and we only had three flights to do this, and there was a possibility of a fourth mission, but that was cancelled. So medical science is probably the most important, uh, because our knowledge of the human body in space 50 years ago is very primitive. Mm -hmm. You've got the, the Apollo space the telescope mount, uh, so your X-ray spectroscopic telescopes, spectrographic, ultraviolet scanning, X-ray telescopes, coronal spectroheliograph, did a lot of work on the, the sun, uh, and so you've got all the science stuff they were doing and the technology, uh, and one of the big things about Skylab's Earth resources, uh, it, it also flew a lot of student experiments, uh, and then of course there's the, the, the operations. And one of the things about Skylab was it discovered oil, and the oil that it discovered paid for it about three times over. So we got all these idiots and the certain newspapers running the space program that it was a waste of money and all the rest of it. And I just give you an idea uh, that the uh, you know the what, what we could do with the uh, Earth resources. So this is one of the, the student ones, determining general characteristics and location of celestial X-ray sources. So what's a schools across the United States and universities and all that could uh, uh, participate. The BBC Apollo moon flights, it was extremely limited to what you could do at all really. Here it opened the door to a whole lot of stuff. So this is the Apollo telescope mount uh, and this is at the launch processing uh, facility. And uh, this is it being mounted onto the adapter part that goes on to the space station. Uh, this is uh, a device that was used for a, a, a gamma rays uh, detection of gamma rays. Uh, and this is uh, the spacecraft inside the, the VAB. I think it's at the point when they were doing the Apollo 16 processing, uh, Skylab had been delivered. Uh, and you can see there's the sections of the rockets behind it that are still for Apollo 17 at the back there and for the Skylab rocket. Uh, and that's then meeting the uh, inside the VAB, putting the space station on top of the rocket. Uh, and so there was a whole lot of astronauts that uh, some of these guys never got, they got bumped from Apollo because Apollo was kind of cut short. Uh, and so it ended up, they only did enough rockets really left so they could do three flights. And uh, the, the first flight was commanded by Pete Conrad. He actually was the first astronaut I ever met back in 1979. Uh, he had flown on, uh, he was on the moon on Apollo 12, and uh, it's Kerwin and uh, Wheats uh, on the first flight. Uh, on the second flight, uh, we had Jerry Carr, Ed Gibson, and, uh, and William Poe. I've actually 
of that of that Jada Carl, I'll show you a picture like that, and of that Paul. And Ed Gibson's unique to me because he's, he's the first astronaut that's asked me to be a friend on Facebook rather than the other way around. Uh, sadly, we were due to get Ed at Pontefract. He was coming over, but then he took ill, and then he had an operation, and it wasn't up to travelling, and then COVID came along, and that destroyed all that kind of stuff. Uh, Jack Lousma, who we had down at Pontefract, uh, he's an amazing guy. Uh, he was one of the Apollo astronauts that ever go up to the moon. Owen Garriott, his son actually later on went up as a space tourist. And, and Alvin, who I met as well, and, uh, he, he flew on Apollo 12. So this is a photograph taken uh, uh, from the, the, the space beach looking back and you can see the Saturn V and the 1B and it's about, it's about roughly three miles that separate uh, these launch pads. The Skylab was launched on the 14th of May 1973 at 17.30 uh, Universal Time, uh, which would have been about 6.30 UK time. And I watched it live. The BBC showed that live. Uh, the, the last launch of uh, a Saturn V rocket, it lasted about 30 seconds. It took off because it just disappeared by the clouds. The British Interplanetary Society, which I'm a member of, organised these famous expeditions to the Cape after Apollo 13 in 1970. They decided that they would organise a trip. And if you had a bit of money, you could go on the famous transolar trips to uh, Cape Kennedy. The Skylab one, one of the members of the Paisley Astronomical Society, Brian, I think his name is, I forget what he's saying, he, he's a pretty young guy, and he, and he went. Uh, he's the only person I know that, that, that went to Skylab. And I think it cost about £84 to go, and that included all your flights and your, you know that. We were going back 50 years ago. Uh, eh, and, and this was a double header because what you were going to get was on Apollo, you only get seen one launch to the moon, but on Skylab, the astronauts were going to be launched the following day. And as I'll talk about in a minute or two, that unfortunately didn't happen. And, and most of these guys, one of the guys, uh, he heard it live on the taxi radio on the way back from Heathrow Airport up in the top of the UK. Uh, so Skylab was put into uh, a 50 degrees inclination orbit, which is totally weird. And I think there's a reason for that. Uh, the apogee was about 274 miles. It's the highest point. The orbital period was 93 minutes, and it did roughly about 15.4 orbits in a day. What I didn't know was that Skylab was visible in Scotland, uh, though it was because uh, I remember on the sky at night I didn't see the program, but Eric Pollock did see it. Uh, James Buck was on, and they told you in certain English towns when you would see it. And being only 13 at the time and not having any of the knowledge I've got now, I thought, well, you can't see it in Scotland, as usual. So. But uh, Duncan Lunan saw it many times from Trim. He told me, you know, I've never, you know. Uh, uh, now, eventually it spent just over six years in space and it was occupied for 171 days. Uh, it, it, it achieved a total of 34,981 orbits uh, and it re-entered, and I'll come to that later on, July the 11th, 1979. Uh, and the order was put into McDonnell Douglas on the 8th of August 1969 to build two space stations. And so I'm going to read that bit out and then we'll go to the next. So this diagram here shows the, the, the mission sequence. So you might remember about a year or two back, I, I was on the other trek on Christmas Day watching the James Webb Space Telescope, because it had to unfurl when 300 objects had to all fold out, and if one of these or two of these, the thing's back 
So Skylark was a bit like that it had the, the, the most critical, the first thing that you had to do was unfurl the Apollo telescope out. And then you would put up the solar panels and then you deploy the, 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 the main solar panels and it would go into orbit. Uh, and then the following day, the first crew on the Saturn 1B would go up and they would, they would link up with it. So this is the, the, the first flight. Now, when we talk about Skylab, it's really confusing uh, because they made a, the, the, the PA office, the Public Affairs office in NASA made a right dog's breakfast of this. Uh, the, the engineers count the launch as number one. And I think the PA office, the Public Affairs, and the way I do it is that I, I, I go by the astronaut launch. So the first launch is the first man launch. Uh, and that's the way that I've done it. And it was quite confusing when I was making up this talk to getting the pictures on it, because it depends on, on the source. So the, the badge here was designed by a science fiction writer called Ben Bova. And Ben Bova, as some of you might remember, Ben Bova was quite a lot of great books. I don't know, is he having an Albert one, Chris? Ben Bova? Do you ever get him? Good. I'll uh have -huh, to come over here. Right, right, right. So Ben Ben Bova, you know, and uh, that was Kelly Kelly Free, I think I've pronounced design the badge. And the badge shows the Earth and space and the sun behind it and Skylab because they're going to be doing they're going to be studying the Earth, but they're also going to be studying the, the sun. Uh, it was launched on the the, the first flight. Uh, there was various delays because of the, the problems that was applying. That's the launch. So that's the that's the, the crew with the rocket, that's right, the rockets were taken off at the size of the photo and after we call the roll out. That's them again. So they did most of these space missions you do about two or three years training before you go up. And it was Buzz Aldrin, he came up with the 1966 idea, he used a big swimming pool and you put stuff in it and then it's the like zero gravity. Uh, so the voice talent here, the astronauts are practicing, we're going to have to do spacewalks to retrieve the film canisters mainly. So these are, the, these are the, that, that's a photograph, the two photographs made up from one, the rocket, and the, the that gives you an eye, it's just a comparison of the size. And that was the launch <coughs> of Skylab, you can see that the, the 1B rocket is, is covered up in the support uh, structure. And then disaster happens. Uh, the Saturn V was very reliable, except for the first launch and the last launch. The first launch, Apollo 4, I think it was, uh, it was a bit too powerful. It had a thing that we called the Pogo effect. The thing was vibrating, the fuel was sloshing around. Walter Cronkite was you were killed when the TV studio at the, the, the uh, media centre, the ceiling came, caved in. Uh, and uh, uh, they had astronauts been on the first Saturn V launch, they would be killed, basically. When Skylab went up, uh, uh, there were problems uh, with the Saturn V rocket, lots of vibrations, and parts of the paneling was ripped off, uh, and, and stuff on the, the, was damaged. Uh, and that's it, it's just basically like peeling an orange to get you know what is happening there. Uh, and so the result was that when it went into orbit, when we were getting telemetry back and all the rest of it, the, the, the temperatures were from through the roof too hot and all the rest of it. And, and the power was, there was a little later, but less than 50% power. And it became fairly obvious that there were major issues and there was a fight to save the space station. Uh, there's always certainly one of the solar panels hadn't deployed because it had been entangled in the, with the damage. 
uh, and the thing was overheating, so they were going to have to make a shade to put on the outside of the space station to try to cool it down. And they actually, it wasn't Walmart, I can't remember, it was the J.C. Penny or whatever, it was basically like today, going into Walmart and going into the DIY section and getting certain tools and cutting them, but it taking them back to the Johnson Space Center and how we're figuring out, just like what we did uh, in Apollo 13, how we're going to fix this. Uh, and so that meant that the astronauts then had to do more training and of course the flight was delayed. So all the, the BIS people got absolute crap what happened. They got a trip to Disneyland. I'd be major not. And I'd rather stay at the space set because Disneyland it just was new and all about the Walt Disney World, you know what I mean? Instead of watching the uh, uh, so so the astronauts had to put how, how are we going to, to fix this? And at one point it looked that the whole thing was going to be a uh, complete failure. So uh, so finally on the so the space station launched on the, the 25th of May. Uh, so finally on July, sorry, the the thing the, the, the astronauts are launched on May the 25th and uh, the Skylab was launched on May the 14th. Uh, so the uh, so Charles Conrad, Joseph Kerwin and Paul Weitz. Uh, they would go on to, they were so launched from uh, a, well, I think it's Launch Complex 39A, and they would, they, they would, the first flight they spent 28 days of 49 minutes in space, and they returned on the 22nd of June 1973, having set a new space endurance record. Um, they had to do three intravehicular activity spacewalks, uh, the first one on the 26th of May, uh, where they went out uh, with Conrad and a uh, Kerwin. Uh, so there was a, an EVA one, sorry, it was a stand up for one of the astronauts opened the hatch to have a look outside. Uh, he did that for 40 minutes, taking photographs. And then on June the, the, the seventh, the second DVA, Conrad and Kerwin spent three hours, 25 minutes with cutters, cutting cables and trying to, they ended up, they couldn't, one of the solar panels, they just couldn't get it out, so they lost the, the power of that altogether. Uh, and then they had a, a, a third one, or which they did on June the 19th, and that, that they were out for one hour and 36 minutes, uh, and, what, and that was to bring in the film canisters. So this is a, a photograph what the astronauts see on arrival at the space station, uh, and you can see that it's the bit of a state. And I'll just quickly go through them. The, uh, it is just blowing out a bubble of water. Uh, you can see that the, the standard issue watch, the Speedmaster, I've actually got one, I'm looking at one way tonight, the, the, oh, wait, there's a story about watches with Skylar, which we'll come to. Because NASA was under the false impe impression that only a mechanical watch, you know, if you go back to the days of mechanical watches, the wind up watches, real watches, uh, you had a wind up watch and then if it, it, it ran down and then if you forgot to wind up your watch it stopped. So the next development was an automatic mechanical watch that had a weight inside like a pendulum. So that when you're walking around and all the rest of it, it would be constantly. And NASA thought, well that's not going to work in zero gravity. And so they ended up, they selected the Omega Space Speedmaster. Very student uh, experiments. I remember this one, this is famous. This is Arabella the Spider. And the, the only reason I know about this is because it, it was on News at 10. They got a lot of coverage on the UK. As usual, the BBC and I think it was just Skylark was ignored. There was very little coverage in the UK whatsoever. And of course, in those days, there was no internet. I was only 13 years old, so I couldn't afford to join the British Aeroponetry Society to get the space light magazine, and you couldn't go into the shops and buy that space magazine. There was virtually no 
Uh, so this is what the control panel to the Apollo telescope mount looks like, the face of the cage. This is uh, Jack Lewisma having a shower. Uh, and this is doing the lots of medical stuff, taking blood pressure and uh, etc. Uh, and he's, he's standing inside a, a pressure chamber. I think the Russians found this, pretty, the Soviets found that, because uh, your, your body mass deteriorates, your bones deteriorate, muscle weight. So the, the Russians developed an idea where you went into this kind of tube, it's like a pressure thing in it. It put like uh, pressure on your body and you'd go in so many hours so many days so you'd spend time in this thing before you before coming back to Earth. So this is doing a spacewalk on the Apollo telescope out to retrieve the film canisters. It's just like you remember on the Apollo flights that you know when they're coming back from the moon, the command module pilot who, who had to stay in orbit, uh, he, he got his bit of fame and he got doing the spacewalk. Uh, so my uh, late friend Colonel Warden, you know, told me all about how we did spacewalk to get the the uh, get the film out. You know. So we're moving on to the second flight, uh, which the crew was Alan Bean on Garriott. Alan Bean was the commander, and on on Garriott was known as the science pilot, and Jack Lousma was the pilot. And that was launched on the 28th of July 1973 from Launch Complex 39B. So it gives a, that's the one that Artemis is getting launched from. Uh, the SpaceX is using 39A. All the Apollo missions, with the exception, I think, of Apollo 12, were launched from 39A. Uh, they spent 58 days, 15 hours and 30, 39 minutes and 42 seconds in space. They had three EVAs during their flight. Garriott and Lousma went out on August the 6th. They spent six hours, 29 minutes. Uh, they, they also did a second spacewalk on the 24th of August for four hours, 30 minutes. Uh, and then on the, the, the third uh, one, uh, being in Garriott on September the 22nd, so two hours and 45 minutes. Now, the patch was based on a, we, it's a design by Leonardo da Vinci, you know, uh, the human body and all the rest of it. So the astronauts' lives weren't exactly happy about this, so they got their own, the Universal Woman patch, which is the, the, the female equivalent of this design, and, and it had the three ladies' names on it. And, they, 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 were, they got into the command module and they were stuck all over the place and they only got a book out or they got a piece of equipment they, they got seen, seen this. Uh, so that was the, the design of the uh, hatch. Now on this flight there was a, a, a scare on this flight because the, the, you know it's pretty early on there was a propellant leak in the command module. Uh, and that could go to the point that either the, the, the flight was going to have to be aborted or the uh, DVD might even need to be rescued. Now, there was a very famous film, I've got the DVD called Marooned, uh, starring Gregory Peck, which was in 1969. Uh, I, and it's a wet, wet space station of Skylab in that movie. Uh, and the and they stranded in space, and I think they get rescued by the Russians. So NASA actually had uh, there was actually a rescue thing that they'd actually thought about that was put in place, uh, and they had a, a Saturn One B rocket and a modified Apollo spacecraft. Uh, so, so, uh, so one of the things that they they had been working on in the Gemini program way back in the 60s was a manned maneuvering unit uh, and, uh, and this is the thing that was uh, Bruce McCandless and I got to meet Bruce quite uh, a lot of times uh, we, so he was the guy that was responsible for designing it, it was like a, uh, a, a, a something like science fiction but it was like a backpack and you could fly around and you weren't, uh, you weren't uh, uh, attached to the spacecraft or a cable 
and uh, they soon found out in a uh, Gemini that space uh, walks were a lot more difficult than what they thought it was. Uh, Eugene Cernan tried to do this and he did a terrible time of it. The thing was bolted at the back of the Gemini spacecraft. He would do a spacewalk to go around the back and then he would strap into the backpack and then he was supposed to come out and fly around. And that never happened. So eventually that was abandoned. So because Skylab was so big inside, uh, they, they could get it working and go through all the stuff inside. They didn't use it outside the space station, but they used it inside. And in 1984, I took live television images of, of the news and stuff when uh, uh, Robert Stewart and Bruce McCandless flew the, the man maneuvering unit on the shuttle. And they used that to fix satellites. So that's a picture of the, I think it's probably a, in a simulator, that's the third crew, crew at the Apollo telescope. Right? Uh, this is my favourite Skylab photograph. Uh, and you can see the black camera that appears to be floating in the air. That is the Polaroid SX-70 camera. And that camera came out in 1972. I always wanted one as a kid, but it cost a fortune that we could never afford one. I've got one now, it cost me about 400 quid to so get a reconditioned one. Uh, it's a single lens reflex. And what, the, what that was used for was to take photographs of the sun from the telescope image. They actually used a Polaroid camera. And that's the thing, I did a talk at Astra years ago, I could do a whole talk about Polaroid in space, because it was used, it was used quite a lot. So this is a picture of Jack Lousma doing one of the, the spacewalks to get the film canisters. And again, <coughs> Uh, this is leaving Skylab, so in this picture you can see the, the tarpaulin light thing that they put up to create a sun shape to cool it down. And you can see that there was only one uh, solar panel to deployed. So we go on to the, the final flight of Skylab 3. Uh, when she was the commander of his general car. The science pilot was Ed Gibson, and the pilot was William Polk. Now the patch is quite interesting, it shows the three areas of investigations. So the, the partly, the, so the tree is to do the earth resources uh, and stuff, uh, you know, studying the earth. The hydrogen atom, uh, is because they're doing heliophysics and all the rest of it. And the rainbow is it, the rainbow is from the Bible, which God's promise to uh, human to mankind after the Noah flood. Uh, so that's what that means. That's the crew, the National Geographic Earth Globe. Uh, and that's the rocket about to go. As far as I know, none of these rock launches were sh shown live in the BBC. I know that the BBC uh, did the live coverage of some of the splashdowns in Skylab. I know that because David Harland recorded them. And I bought a whole pile of all these Apollo tapes off them. Uh, but they weren't special programmes, they were in other programmes. So I was just a kid at the time. So you pretty boring news programs I didn't watch on the other side. Well, I had no idea when they were coming back because you could only get what you read in the papers. So there's the, the launch. And I think on this flight they were having technical issues with the, the rocket and it was that bad that the Soviets were even off them to take them up at one point. Uh, but they got them, uh, they got it off the ground at uh, so the view of the space station again. And again, and you can see there's the SX-70 camera, and it's like a cardboard foil makeup thing over the <coughs> over cathode ray tube to take photographs of the picture from the telescope. That's how they, they, they did it. So a lot of stuff is done on the sun. Uh, so this, you can see 
and you can see the arch tiny compared to the sun. I think of all the Skylab pictures, this is the most well-known one, huge, huge promise to come off the sun. So what we learned, there was a huge increase in heliophysics to study the sun sky map. It really was amazing. Or oh, the ultraviolet picture of the sun. Now, the big thing in astronomy in 1973, if any of you around remember it, you know, uh, was the discovery of, by Dr. Lubus Pogutek of a comet. And for the first half of 1973, we thought this was going to be really big. And Patrick Moore was going on about the comet of the century and all the rest of it. It ended up like Halley's Comet at the end of flop. It was it wasn't very, unfortunately it wasn't very prominent at all. And I saw it was the first comet that I saw, and I saw observed it with the 10-inch refractor at the Coates Observatory in Paisley. And uh, it wasn't even, I don't think it was naked eye. I mean, it, it, there were loads of books, Patrick Muir's panels of books are published, and it's come up in detail to go there. And it's not like, a, a, a let down. So there was an opportunity on Skylab uh, to, to study a comet. And of course, the next opportunity, of course, was in 1986 on in Challenger. And tragically, that never happened to you. And this is what the comet, this is exactly who I remember. I remember it, it, it was a green blob, and that's exactly, and it didn't really have a tail. And that's an ultraviolet picture of the comet, you know. So if you remember back to uh, the Giotto pictures of Halley's comet with all the colours, you know. Uh, these are, this is drawings that Ed Gibson made, of, you know, on Skylab, of what, how he saw it. Uh, this is a uh, Lubus Kohutek at the Johnson Space Center, or in those days it was known as the Mind Space Map Center, Houston, uh, talking to the astronauts about the comet. This is getting rid of rubbish, getting ready to come home. So you open the, the, the door and you stick all your rubbish down and you shoot, basically. Uh, unfortunately, towards the end of the mission, the thing seized up. Probably the heat bubble in it, and they couldn't open it. You know, so, uh, and that was we would talk about reusing Skylab in a minute. So, uh, you get your hair cut in space. Uh, so, the main difference is you're going to need a vacuum cleaner and you'll get your hair to stop the hair going all over the place. They could do a lot of tricks like that. The food was a huge improvement in Skylab, and we learned so much from Skylab that we could put into the shuttle uh, in development of space flight. Uh, so the, the thing at the top, the silver, well, that's not a camera, that's a light meter. And that was, I forget which one, that's a light meter that the Apollo astronauts used on the moon. Uh, the same one. Tele television inside Skylab was on the Baird process of sequential telecolour. Uh, as was used on the moon and on the early uh, shuttle missions. Skylab took lots <laughs> of pictures. Uh, and uh, this is an infamous picture. This is uh, the astronauts were told you want to photograph this area when you go over it. It's, done, it's in Nevada, it's a uh, Groom Lake, it's area 51. And the astronauts took a photograph of it anyway. Uh, and this caused a huge rumpus. Uh, there's, there's an article in the Space, the reason why I know about this, there's an article in the Space Review magazine a few months or a year or two back about this. And it was only years later that they agreed to issue a low definition image of it. But it's freely available on the NASA website. So that, that was the most controversial uh, picture in Skylab, or was it really? Uh, Earth, there's a big hurricane developing uh, that the astronauts took a photograph of. So it's coming out and down the, from the docking module into the space station. A huge amount of, there's a famous movie, you see them running around and diving in sight, that's this picture. Yes. Uh, well, maybe I should be talking about this now. 
So caffeine form fins said to me, I'm afraid Robert, I'm going to have to kill you. you know? And that is a standard uh, response from astronauts who flew military flights in the space shuttle. That I have a good idea of what I think was going on and all the rest of it. You see these, you see these, these balls here, there's number four, there's number two. There's a certain amount of evidence that uh, Skylab, the reason why it was in the weird orbit it was in, uh, was so that it could spy on the Soviet Union. Uh, take photographs, and these are captures. Maybe seen that picture where the film was put in and then released from Skylab, and then they would re enter uh, the Defense Department, the Central Intelligence, something like that, maybe the National Reconnaissance Office, I think it is. There's a brilliant picture there showing the, the, the grating on the floors, which takes you back to the, you know, the, that's a leftover from the wet workshop. And of course, I've got the, in the 60s, Major Mark Mason, the space toy in my collection. I've got the space station from 1966, or the, uh, which was meant to be a, a thing on the moon, but it's basically SkyMark. There's another picture there of doing the space box again, be retrieving the, uh, the, the film. Now, when I talk about the, the Omega Speedmaster watch, uh, the, uh, that was the official issue, and you couldn't use automatic, we were told by NASA, you couldn't use uh, uh, automatic watches, blah, blah, blah. So Bill Pogue decided to sneak on board, like D Dave Scott sneaked his Beluga watch on Apollo 15, and that was just as uh, well because the, the, the plastic capsule came off. So on the second Apollo 15 spacewalk, he just used his own watch, you know. Uh, so this is uh, Bill Pogue's sequel uh, watch. I think it sold recently in an auction for thousands and thousands of dollars. You know, it was kept in. I know it was kept in a safe deposit box for years and years. But it works. An automatic watch works perfectly. Uh, eventually, get to the point the Russian cosmonauts were not using, uh, you know, battery watches. They came along uh, 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 LCD. Watch is invented to a guy in Dundee, of course, who I met, and he came up to the observatory a couple of years ago, and he never got a penny for that, you know, because the Dundee University got all of the, the money. This is the in-flight uh, press conference. This kind of thing started in Apollo, and it carried on in Skylab, and it carried on the, on the, the shuttle. Uh, you notice, so if you look closely at this picture, that the scanning lights of the TV picture are, are vertical. And originally, when Baird invented television, the scanning lights were vertical. We eventually moved on to Marconi MI used horizontal scanning, but the Americans always used vertical scanning on their TV pictures. They're about to come home, so it's a trick in case anyone else does go up. They, they got all these spacesuits and made them look like dummy astronauts in the middle of the space station doing things. Uh, and then finally, it's time to come home. Uh, things are now beginning to get bad for the American space program. Uh, basically, Skylab had, even with their problems, had so much potential. Uh, but we weren't interested, you know, I'll come to that in a minute. So there was a, there, there was, they looked into what would we have to do, and this nearly happened through the time that you get a rescue mission if you were going to be stranded. And they, uh, so they, there was a, a Saturn five, so sorry, Saturn 1B rocket and a modified Apollo command module. And if you go to the Sat 5 Center at the Kennedy Space Center Visitors Complex, the, the spacecraft is still there, you can see it. So they ripped out a whole lot of things, and what they did was they converted it so that you'd sit down with three astronauts, you could get five. Uh, and Van Spride and a. What's his name? 
what can I say, I forgot his name. That's what incidentally was an astronaut, Don Lentz, that's right, Don Lentz. This is the astronaut that came to see me at the Coates Observatory on the map one when I was on holiday or region when I found out that we didn't get to meet. Uh, Don Lind was meant to go on one of the late Apollo missions. I think it was an Apollo 19, but you can see getting bumped because they, and he, he ended up on Skylab and he even flew on Challenger, so he was in there. Uh, he became he was a, a Mormon, so at one point he became an ambassador for the Mormon Church in, in the UK, and that was how I, I, I got to the reason I got to meet him basically was that when I worked in the observatory in Paisley, I, I, I did like private group visits on a Tuesday night and public viewing on a Thursday, and it done to a shambles. I've got to do the two in the same night now. So they, uh, and the Mormon church had been a few times, so they brought him up to see me. And of course, I got this phone call, I was on holiday at the time, I couldn't go. But I did get to see Don, because he did a, a talk in the Mormon church in Glenburn and Paisley about when I came back. Uh, Vance Brand, would, who flew on the Apollo Soyuz test mission, I think he's in his 90s now. Uh, 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 he also would fly on the shuttle. So these two astronauts would have been the crew for an emergency a rescue mission if he was stranded in Skylar. Ev eventually, the, the fuel leak, uh, what they, they determined that the fuel leak was so low in the command module it wasn't going to be a problem. So in this photograph, you can see the Apollo spaceship and demated from the from the 1B rocket. There was a point, a serious talk of a fourth flight to Skylab, but then because the cuts of the space program and Jimmy Carter, anti-space president like Obama, cut the budget and tried to destroy the shuttle when there was a, he was not interested. And uh, NASA was struggling because they were having to develop the shuttle. They, they, when they were developed Apollo, it had uh, a, you know, the black check book. Uh, with the shuttle, you didn't, and uh, you can only work off your budget. And if the, just like the Scottish budget a couple of days ago, if you, your budget slashed, then you can't do stuff, and it takes longer. This is the rescue rocket. You can see it's in the rocket garden at the space center. Now, what could have happened with Skylark? One of the things that we could have had was an international space station in 1977 at a fraction of the cost of what a, the ISS would let him do. Uh, problem, Jimmy Carter was not interested in space. So the NASA wasn't going to get any money. Other problem was that relations between the United States and the Soviet Union were starting to deteriorate. Uh, but they did actually look at uh, having a Soviet space station joined on to Skylab uh, this is because the, they built two, this is Skylar B. Uh, the problem is that NASA had the bits to launch this, but the problem was because it was so, there was so much money that they couldn't afford it because they were needing that money for the shuttle, developing the shuttle. And the shuttle was getting, the problems with the shuttle was getting further and further along. And then the, the argument was is that this space station could go up, but then the Americans would only be able to visit it once, you know. They don't they'd have to depend on the Russians. Oh, I mean, since it ended up in the Obama administration, perhaps in space, they had to uh, depend on Russia to get up there. So unfortunately, this idea never happened, basically, because, uh, and we'd have to wait to President Clinton in the 1990s before they, we got international cooperation with the this Russians. Uh, and of course, the end came. Skylab would be basically, there were lots of proposals to use Skylab, but a lot of senior management in, in NASA was just not interested. It reminds me a lot of Airtree Observatory, actually. There was so much potential at Airtree that what could have been done. Uh, we wanted an astronomy project that was blocked and blocked and blocked. Uh, and then there are things that asked or could have done that I want things I wanted to have that never happened. They're just not interested. Uh, doing real science, for example, but the, uh, it, this is the issue. Every time anybody in NASA brought up their various proposals, the management would not. 
eventually it was coming down uh, in 1979, the solar maximum, we had massive auroral displays, the, uh, the Earth's uh, atmosphere was heated up, uh, and that uh, brought the end of Skylab. And it was actually, it could theoretically crash in the UK. Uh, Cornwall, maybe London or whatever, you know, there was a lot of, they, 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 they brought a uh, people uh, back to, uh, a, so it's a July the 11th, 1979. Uh, they started communicating with a space station that had been abandoned and all worked right away. They were doing communicating with it. Uh, they had limited uh, a control over it. And as far as I'm concerned, it was just the general incompetence of the Carter administration. And it's a miracle that nobody was actually killed on the ground. But that's absolutely pathetic. Uh, and uh, it ended up, it came down in Australia, there's huge parts of the Apollo telescope now that's intact, there's enough to demolish a house. Fortunately, it went into the outback, as they call it, and I remember the Australian government sent NASA a huge bill for the, the clean-up operations. Uh, that's a photograph of the, I, I don't like photographs like this, but it's a photograph of the V-engine. And it's Time Magazine, here comes Skylab, 10 years after the moon launch. What an absolute shambles. By now the Soviet Union was taking the lead off of the, from America in space. They had obtained space stations by this time. Uh, militarily, the Soviet Union was doing stuff in military space stations, in science space stations, uh, and this is what we come to. We think that 10 years after, uh, the moonwalk, we should have had people going to Mars. There were various proposals well looked at uh, about using the shuttle to, uh, to boost Skylab into uh, uh, a higher orbit and then it could be reused again. But unfortunately, delays, the first shuttle flight was in 1978, but because of delays with the engines, delays with the thermal protection system, cuts for the current administration and the budget, the shuttle was falling back further and further. So the shuttle didn't actually fly until April 1981. Uh, I'll never forget the day going home from Macro on the Greens bus to Linwood. Uh, and the driver had the radio on and the news came on to arms and tears when the news came on that Skylab had re-entered and crashed into Australia. But had that not happened, there was a possibility in the 1980s uh, uh, that we could have used the, the shuttle and the Skylab. This thing here was uh, built as a spacecraft that would go up on the shuttle and the shuttle would be deployed and, and it would join on the Skylab and it would boost it into higher orbit. Uh, I think Duncan Lunan was there, he was over for the Apollo Soyuz, and Duncan told me that he saw, I'm sure that Duncan told me that he saw this inside the V8B, no. So I don't know if it still exists, but they built this, but it was, sadly it was never used. So one of the, uh, assuming they were going to use it, one of the early shuttle missions we brought up a solar power pack. And this is a design that we talked about in the 80s and then it fell away and came back in the 90s. Because the problem with the space shuttle was you could only go into space for about seven days, eight days. So they developed this power system where you could maybe keep a shuttle in space for about a month. Uh, there was a lot of talk in the Clinton, the early Clinton administration, and several a proper space station, which is sort of an antenna, and that means that you would go and you would visit, and then you would come back and you went. A bit like what will happen with the Moon Space Station on Artemis. And then the next phase would be uh, uh, because you, you could you could throttle up the amount of some huge arguments and ask her about this. So it's the, uh, Duncan Lunan was all for building space stations out of tanks. And, and to do that, you'd have to throw up the engines in a space shuttle by about 125% or something, and you could get the tank into orbit. Uh, the Rogers Commission, after the Challenger accident, said, no, oh, you're not going to, it's too dangerous, you can't, you can't do that. But theoretically, you could use tanks, because these were just dumped and they bump up the atmosphere, but you could attach a shuttle uh, tank to Skylab and that gives you a lot more space inside 
like a weight space station module to convert and in this picture it's got a, some kind of telescope attached to it. Uh, if you're ever in Washington, you go to in 1995, uh, myself and Richard Farsi went on a trip to Washington uh, to the Smithsonian uh, and I went to Arlington because I wanted to go and visit the grave of the Challenger astronauts and you go inside Skylab and you can see I've got video that in the, uh, you see the, the platform there, you can actually go inside it. So that was an actual space station flight hardware that was never used. And what you, what you can't see in that picture just to the, the uh, right of it is the full scale engineering test model of the Hubble Space Telescope at, you know, the full size. This is me and Jerry Carr, this was taken at Cape uh, Kennedy Space Centre, that was when we were there, I think uh, there was a whole team of us from Air Private over uh, several times, uh, and that was, uh, I think, that was back 2018, sadly Jerry died about a year or two ago. And finally, uh, uh, this is Christmas 15 years ago, and I'd just like to wish you all a very happy Christmas. Uh, all the best for 2024 and I hope you find my talk tonight interesting. And here we just see the uh, this Christmas tree that the astronauts made at Christmas on Skylab. And you can see the, the, they've got a Kahootix comet on the top. Okay. <laughs> Very much, Robert. It's a fascinating programme that often gets forgotten, and that's 50 years ago. Do you have any questions before we go? Right. Uh, Robert, why don't we uh, refuel it um, and keep it up longer? Right, but, but, but what you, you don't, it doesn't have any engines on it to do that. So, what, what you did was that when the command service module got to the space station, uh, you do a, a burn. Uh, to boost it and then boost it into higher orbit. So the longer you've got something in this orbiting, then it's going to get lower and lower. And of course this is a problem with the Hubble Space Telescope, that's how when they did the, the self-send missions on the Space Telescope, the shuttle would boost it. So on the International Space Station, that is done by the, the Russian Progress vehicles, mainly the, the, the unmanned version of Soyuz that takes up the R. It was also done using the space shuttle, so that when they, I think it's a, it was a progress flight, you know, I'll be apart that. So when they got the, the dock on the space station, then the, the pilot rocket more of that gives it a wee boost, you know. And you, you, so you, the problem was that the, the orbit that Skylab was in was sufficiently the limited time that NASA could use it because they, they didn't have the money and they only had so many rockets. So the, and there was this gap between Apollo 17 and Apollo Soyuz. Uh, so they didn't, you know, it came down a lot earlier than what we expected because we expected it would have probably lasted into the 1990s. But because of solar activity and all the rest of it, solar maximum was 79 was amazing. I took here people in Florida on the shortwave radio on the Coast Observatory, uh, you know, like CB guys, you know, because of the radio conditions. Maybe there was an aurora, we saw an air train, we just saw like a, I suppose there's a flight like over there, and even down, they said, that's not a flash and aurora, that's your joke. So we went up to Black Hill uh, and we saw this aurora that went right around the whole sky. So it was amazing, you could see the colours and puddles, you know. Uh, a, so because of solar activity, that brought sky maps in. Was it overall this called a success or a failure? Oh, it was a success. What was the point? Oh, it was, it was very successful. Did they do you know, <coughs> the experiments that you showed, did they do them all? They, they did, yes. Uh -huh. As far as I know, it is. It's, uh, it's a member of James Bucks, or if we are and the usual negativity from the BBC if we are a, a semi-failure or other because of the issues like that. And uh, once they got the, 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 the fixing and all the rest of it, then it, it, it carried on. And as far as I know, that they, 
they did all what they wanted to do on Skylabs, so I think it was, it was very successful. <coughs> so it's kind of right the bad point for you. Yeah, how um, did the missing, how did the panel failure recognition? Sorry? How did the panel failure recognition? Well, it impacted, uh, the first thing it did was uh, it limited the power that you could have. So uh, it cut the available power by about 50%, you know. So you still had power, you know. Oh, and then it caused, you know, the lots of the issues with the heat not, so they had to put sunshade. Once once they got the sunshade up, uh, then they, they just had to work out how they were using the, the, the power. So they got away with one solar panel, you know. Uh, it's quite, I mean, I, it was a, a year or two ago, there was this issue that, uh, because the, the fuel prices and electricity bills were going up faster than the certain five. And had it was at least trust not done anything. I reckon by Christmas I wouldn't be able to afford to have electricity in my house. I wouldn't be able to earn enough money to pay the bills. So I went out and I bought this wee solar panel, this wee tiny thing, wee tiny <coughs> solar panel and a battery. And I was absolutely amazed at what that could do. I thought this will be useless, you know, and I could run I could run two light bulbs for eight hours or one light uh, for 16 hours and I could even charge up a TV and watch the telly on it. So you could manage the electricity. So in the end it wasn't a uh, uh, problem. Sorry. The telescope they had take good pictures yes. of the space. Mm -hmm. well, it, it was mainly used for, the, most of the stuff they did was sort the sun. Uh, they took pictures of Kuhutek's comet, uh, they had other equipment for X-ray astronomy, and they had stuff for ultraviolet astronomy, so there were various different things that they did. How big of a telescope was it? Uh, and I'm not entirely sure how big it was or not. Uh, I mean, not uh, nothing compared to Hubble Watch, it'd be a lot smaller, you know. And I, I think when we talk about an Apollo telescope, maybe it's not one telescope, it's several smaller telescopes together. What's interesting yeah. is that the amount of space and the wet floor and water is. The footwork, yeah. triangulation, uh -huh. magnetic pieces, it's dust in the triangles. With this on their feet. Aluminium. Yeah, it's all, because it's light. But the reason why we use aluminium is it's lightweight, you know. So, for instance, in your temperature in Dundee, it's, an, it's a paper mash you don't want an aluminium framework. So, because when you're launching things out of space, you are, it's the weight is always going to be a problem, you know. So, they have to make it as light as possible. So, you have to be very careful in the lunar module. If you lean against the wall, you might fall through it. Change the shoes and the room a bunch of right. Well, are there any plans to do live broadcasts just for the yeah. general public? Was that planned in commission or that? Eh, that's a, 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 a good question. The, the problem with Skylab was that the NASA could only be in communication with huge gaps. You know, it would fly over, and we had that in the shuttle in the early until they put up the, the, the satellites. At the time, NASA TV that we have now didn't exist, so they didn't have that. And it was basically up to the media whether they wanted to come in and cover it. Mm. So, and of course, in the UK, that meant that it was next to nothing. ITN generates a lot better on the BBC for space reporting, and there were several things on News at 10. I mean, it has to be interest. I mean, a lot of times time that the media is only interested in negativity and bad news, but the Arabella, the spider, that kind of created a lot of interest, so that was shown in the media here. There was one Horizon programme that the BBC made several years after it, you know, about Skylab, but at that time, I don't know about America, but here it was pretty primitive. We only had three television channels at the time, you know, so that. It would actually make a good movie. Well, there is a movie, Chris. Somebody has done, they've actually done a, a search oh, for Skylab. Oh, right. There is a documentary that has been produced fairly recently about Skylab, which is the thing I need to get. It's, it's very good, you know. I thought that was a big disappointment because, well, through high school, 
you have your problem issues mm -hmm. and they were on TV, but when Skywalk came along there was nothing. So the, the problem, and it's like the International Space Station, is it gets boring, you know, because what you've got on the space station is people, men and women, doing science experiments and all the rest of it, and they're working. So it, it, it becomes monotonous, and I mean, I've spent hours watching spacewalks with the guys with screwdrivers screw, screwing things, you know, and I, I slag off people for watching Big Brother. <laughs> uh, so it's not, so NASA TV used to have daily coverage of the ISS, but it didn't go on all day, but it scrapped that years ago. And they, they just do one programme on a Friday now, which is the highlights of the week, you know. So it has to be, well, obviously, a moonwalk that like, excites the public because something's happening. But the, the thing about the TV is watching rocket launches and rendezvous and coming back and all the rest of it. The stuff that's actually going on while they're up there is really quite boring, so it doesn't really get covered here. Yeah, like uh -huh. When they do the spacewalks in the ISS, well, that's now live on NASA TV. You can sit and watch it for hours. But then the BBC, and, and this is a problem that I had with the shuttle, but basically uh, the shuttle after about the, 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 the third flight was of only on Radio 2, the launch. And then it was just ignored. And the only time you got stuff throughout the 80s, you got stuff on the news when the shuttle went up. Uh, obviously, when the Challenger happened, when the return flight was discovered in 1988, that was shown live on the BBC. But after that, what they just lost interest in it and again. And that was a problem I had, and that's how eventually the computer technology. Uh, and I can move away from the t t TV and I get my stuff now direct from NASA. I was doing internet protocol, like IPT streaming to, uh, TV in the 1990s, long before Netflix was even. I think at that point Netflix was that cardboard envelope with a CD in it, Chris, when I was doing it. Oh, streaming. The impression that I get from your, uh, from your talk and the feeling I get is, what an opportunity was missed with the food space program. You know, oh, you know, yeah. all, 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 up to 1969 when there was a, I think, an article in, in the paper about um, the Mars mission in 1982. Yeah. Uh -huh. And all, all, all the sort of great things which have happened, mm -hmm. but unfortunately we've got into <coughs> grubby politics. Yeah, but the, the problem of course with all these things, Charles, was the cost. Mm -hmm. You know, it, uh, and then in America, at the end of the 60s, the the space that caused it, the, and the reason why have an environmental movement is actually because of the space program. But there was this kind of backlash in the states against technology, you know, and politicians, you know, like the cost of Apollo, which are kind of was about $250 billion, and it was a hell of a lot of money, you know. And so politicians were just not willing to bankroll that, you know, and that's how the Mars mission never happened because it was just so expensive, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the way that we're doing it, you know, that we tried all these like a pay as you go space program under President Bush, uh, when you, you take, you do a bit at a time because it takes longer, uh, so I mean, President Obama took that a bit further with commercialising it. And so President Trump took a giant leap with that commercialisation. And because of that, now you're seeing private companies coming forward and like this Axum company, uh, who are then using like SpaceX to fly astronauts. Uh, and so maybe we are seeing, you know, that, that it'll be commercial companies rather than governments. It'll be people like Elon Musk and, uh, is it Bezos? Bezos uh, I, I mean, uh, when I was a kid, we read science fiction, I what England stuff is like the, the multi millionaire that would pay for the space program because the government wasn't interested, you know. Uh, and that seems to be, it seems to be the way that it's developing now. But these things like the, uh, the, the Mars, you know, Von Braun in 69 was so we'll go to Mars next, but the, the the, all these proposals, there's a space task force group and Nixon just chucked the whole lot out and the reason was that Nixon had there were problems with the budget 
if you wanted to set your term in office and you get back and cut the budget. So he would give the short old backing because it helped his constituency for jobs. But he said that the NASA would be like every other de government department have to operate in that budget. Uh, uh, Von Braun retired or resigned from NASA in 1970. Do you think that was a factor going yeah. forward? Because well, the reason why Von it wasn't 19 it was it was it later? I think it was later than that. The reason why Von Braun retired from NASA was total delusion that all the, the things that he wanted to do were just not going to happen. Uh, he was also badly treated, and you know because it's German. On the rest of it, you know, and he would be blocked by stuff, you know, like, you know, I mean, that's why the Soviets got in space first, because one Braun could have people, but the Americans, or one of them, one Braun's team, do it. We, so they did the shambles in the army and the navy, and, and, and eventually, one Braun, Braun had to sort out the mess, you know. So he went, he quit, and he went into private, he went into private industry, you know. Uh, uh, it was space related, but he died in 1977. But one left broken because the, the space program was coming to uh, a dead end, basically, because the politicians were not, you know, willing to back it. No, I was just saying it's interesting in the sense that, well, for it, you're pinning your hopes on private enterprise mm -hmm. to do it, but their motivation will always be suspect. Right? Well, their motivation is this, yeah. and at the end of the so. day, that's what it's about, you know. Uh, even, yeah, I would, uh, I, I, I think it's awful what Obama did by the blue. I totally disagree with this, you know, it was just pathetic. It, it, it destroyed the space program, it put the space program back for 25 years, you know. They have some good points to, I mean, commercialization is not new. Ronald Reagan started that in the 80s where he commercialized the, the launch processing. I mean, it used to be NASA that launched the shuttle, but it became a private United Space Alliance, you know. And that cost the, the whole point of privatization is that it costs the government less, you know. First, what was the first space privatization in Scotland? Uh, 19, it was Monkland's Council, 1977, when they got Astra to run the observatory, and Astra was the company yeah. rather than the council doing that. And, and there was a lot of them Astra didn't well, Astra were the, <laughs> they broke away from the BIS, yeah. the British uh -huh. Interplanetary Society, in 1963. Uh -huh. yeah. So that was so of BIS. private, you know. Uh, and the, the, the hope is that, you know, the, there's now, it's quite a thing actually, there's uh, a growth, they're going to have commercial space stations, uh, there's one being built in Italy at the moment, actually building one, and uh, it's quite, it's amazing. Uh, Hungary, now uh, Hungary caused a huge, I thought this was amazing, Hungary caused a huge outrage at the Council meeting of the European Space Agency last year, because when, when, let's face it, when is Hungary going to get its astronauts? I remember of ESA, we got the French, the Germans, and the Italians, uh, the, the UK. When are you going to get a flight? You're never going to get a flight. So what, what they did was, thanks to Elon, they went to Axon Space, and the, the Hungarian government has booked a flight of Hungary's uh, astronaut, and uh, this caused hell and earth at the ESA Council. Because they put in, I think it was about 200 million euros or whatever it is, you know. Uh, but that way, and good for them, that way that Hungary is going to get astronauts in space. So the costs are coming down. There are a lot of countries now, back in the, the day, the, the communist countries could take part in the Intersputnik program and the Russians, the Soviets would fly them in space. Uh, nowadays, it's, uh, the Russians don't do that anymore. And it's basically it's commercial companies that they put. So we're even going to have the UK governments giving the go ahead to support the all British space mission, and which will become ended by Tim Peake, and that will be Axon Space, who will probably fly them on us. They'll ask Mr. Musk to book his rocket, you know, unless they go for the Boeing. Any more questions before we go? Well, thanks again, Thank Robert, for bringing that mystery alive again.
that just leaves me to say thanks very much for coming tonight. Thanks for all your support during the last year. It's been a very busy, active year for ASD. We've now got our own observatory. 